Hello and welcome to my in-depth constructed series. For now, I will showcase my gauntlet rounds. The gauntlet is a recurring best of three format that comes back each weekend and you will, you can play for your spot in the last chance gauntlet for seasonals. So that's always something on the line. I plan to document my ladder grind as well in the future. However, I don't like playing the ladder when it's not solved yet. I don't really like experimenting with random decks because you can just climb much faster if you find the best deck to counter the meta instead of just bringing your own homebrew that doesn't necessarily do that well. So this will probably be the next week or the week after that that we will be focused more on the constructed ladder. And for now, I will showcase my gauntlet. And I really like the gauntlet format for two different reasons. First of all, it's best of three, so you can have a little bit more deck building decisions. It's not like ladder, they just queue up, and if you hit a good matchup, you're happy. If you hit a bad matchup, you're sad. You can much better prepare for a best of three format than for a best of one format. And other thing is we face against players from different skill levels. There will be some that are total beginners, others that are very advanced. And we will see, or you will see already in this first gauntlet that there are a lot of different skill levels and a lot of different decks as well because of these different skill levels. This video and format will not be a normal constructed video that you know from other channels where I just sit here and talk you through everything while the gameplay is running. Instead, I want to focus on a few key decisions around five to six per game and speed through the rest of the game, accelerate a little bit without much commentary and give you the chance to improve your gameplay by thinking about what you would have done in this situation, how you would have played out the game from this spot. And I also want to take a big focus on the deck expectations because that's a very big point of best of three, knowing what your opponent will play and could play. Of course, if you play in season as you get open deck lists. So I think gauntlet is even more interesting than open deck lists and general approaches to matchups and general game plans will be another big focus of the series. So let's jump right into our first gauntlet match. These will all be short videos that are post commentated. So no live commentary. Instead, I can talk as much as I want about certain points and skip through the others. They're not very interesting. And I hope this will be educational for you and will help you improve your own constructed gameplay. Deuce brings three decks as everybody and he has a Diego Callista with Ionia, a Pantheon Taric with Ionia, and Una and Tristana with Bandle City. So Diego and Ionia is a typical constructed deck. It's usually played with Diego Kindred, and you can see a list on the screen right now. I have expected to see this list from this deck instead of playing Kindred, playing Callista. It doesn't seem like the worst idea because Callista can technically bring back the encroaching mists. And this Viego deck has typically been very weak against very aggressive decks, but quite strong against the other slow decks in the format. So my Darkness would have a little bit of a hard time versus it. My other two decks, Bandle Tree and Scouts, should do fine. In the middle, we have Tyric Pantheon, which is usually played with Demacia. However, this person chose to bring Ionia. But for our lineup, these big mid-range, I build huge units decks are quite problematic. All three of our decks are unfavored with this classic Pantheon and Taric version. And even if it brings Ionia and has like barriers and will of Ionia instead of the typical rally and sharp side, this could be problematic. On the right side, I've expected a typical Banal City mid-range deck. Tristana wants you to have multi-region allies. Na also wants multi-region allies. So just a typical Banal City curve deck with some random units. Overall, not meta decks, so you have to immediately think about what is good against my lineup, what is bad, you can just go to your stat side, and then you have to actually make decisions yourself. And for me, the decision for this first one was pretty clear, which to ban, and I went with the Pantheon Taric, just with my lineup. This is the most problematic opponent to face. You see that our opponent banned Darkness, and we now have to choose which deck we want to pilot first. Personally, I always go with the deck I know I can play better, unless one has a clear, better matchup. I don't think we have any clear matchups since these other decks are not meta decks. So I went with my personal favorite deck, which is Bandle Tree. 
and queued up with it. My opponent chose to bring his or her bandit to standard deck and we ride right away into the mulligan. So for the matchup, I expected this deck to potentially be another bandit tree deck. So it could be a mirror matchup, however, they didn't play any Noxus cards. And it seemed a little bit unlikely to play Na and Tristana with Bandle Tree. Instead, I expected more of a normal mid-range deck. This meant that we might be a little bit weaker in the mid-game to them. But as long as we have a Bandle Tree in the end, we should have no problem to really get an advantage later on. So from this spot on, how would you mulligan? Should be pretty obvious that we want to keep our one drop cannon in our opening hand. Usually always keep him is just a one mana two one. Banal City Ionia, you don't really care about. If he gets pinged, if he dies. And also Banal City Mayor is a good keep unless you have this very high aggressive decks and have no other curve. I also like keeping him in my hand. Because both the opponent's champions have three health on the base level, I also decided to keep Buster Shot just as a reactive answer. Of course, Minimorph is not problematic. I only like Minimorph in very specific matchups like Lee Sin, for example, where you automatically win if you have Minimorph. So usually another card you want to keep in your opening hand. The first deal decision was with our Loping Telescope on turn two. And we actually had a little bit of an awkward choice here between the Moon Glow, the Lost Soul, and the Furious Fairfolk. Which one would you go for? So the Moon Glow seemed very unappealing because Bandit City doesn't really have that good of removal spells. They have their own buster shots, but generally not something I really want to protect here in this deck. We could protect our Bandit City Mayors, but I generally like to be more proactive in Battle Tree and progress my own game plan. This was left us between Lost Soul and Furious Fairfolk and both could contribute something to our bandit tree level up in the Noxus or PNC. However, the Lost Soul is just way more expensive whereas we have two bandit city mayors in our opening hand. So we get a bunch of discounts on the Furious Fairfolk and can bring it down at four or five, for example. So awkward choices, but pretty clear Furious Fairfolk for me looking back to this pick. Next decision to be made was with our first Banner City Mayor. Again, three cards to choose from, and this is why I really like playing the Banner Tree deck. You have constant decisions that can impact your future gameplay. So I think most people would just automatically go for the Loping Telescope here, just getting more units on the board and finding more stuff. However, I chose to go for the Shark Train for, for two reasons. First of all, I don't think we have to outswarm them. As long as we go big, Bandit City doesn't really have any hard removal on set for Minimorph. And if they play Minimorph on my Shark Trainer, that's totally fine. We still have two Bandit City Mayors in our hand or soon on the board. So our Shark Trainer gets multiple discounts. I also always want to work towards my Bandit Tree level up, my Bandit Tree win condition. And we both have played Ionia and Targon before with the Cannon and Loping Telescope. We didn't play Bilgewater yet. And Shark Trainer is just something that's very hard to deal with for a mono Banal City deck. The next decision point was our second Banal City Mayor and this one might look close, but again, keep in mind your bandit city win condition, your bandit tree, and that you want to complete all different regions. We already have a PNC card in our hand for the Furious Fairfolk. We already have played a Targon card of Loping Telescope. So the Bomber Twins seems like the very obvious choice here. You can also throw it down this turn and have a blocker. You always want to work towards that win condition, even if you don't have it in your hand.
We then on turn five play out our shark trainer. That's got double discounted. I think this decision is pretty obvious because our furious fairfolk is not yet activated. And Ben is the mayor only discounts the first unit you play each turn. So shark trainer it is. This is actually an interesting blocking decision. Do we block with the 4-1 or with the 3-2? And what would you think? How would you block here? So I was of the opinion that our 4-1 overwhelm is probably stronger in this matchup because the 3-2 doesn't have overwhelm and they will have a bunch of small units, so our 4-1 will at least deal some damage. However, I was soon proven to be incorrect because our opponent played a Toad, the new 5-mana card that on transform deals one to everybody. Playing around this card, throwing away our 4-1 might have been a better play here, but I'm not sure if you can actually expect this card, expect it more of a multi-region deck, not just some random Battle City cards. It's our turn again, how would you proceed here? Would you open attack, would you develop some more? What would be your line of action? I decided to still develop here because I was afraid of a potential mini morph and we have this potential to just develop for zero mana and maybe find a good stun effect or some other way to push a lot of damage. I didn't think we are in a hurry to really push in damage. We are also winning the long game currently with our shark trainer for multiple removal spells. So developing seemed better for me, however I can definitely see the open attack as well. For the loping telescope, we have another interesting choice. At this point, like we're looking back to it, I definitely also like the crescent strike. Being more aggressive is sometimes my, my weakness. I usually just try to win for the long game. And of course you don't want that last cone seedling because you already have Ionia and she's just a random two mana two two. However, the Ras is just a very powerful effect and can take down your units and is a shadow eyes card which you don't have yet. On the other hand, Crescent Strike might have been the better choice in the end. Really close for me. I chose Raz in this game. If I could go back, I might just choose the Crescent Strike and try to push for lethal here. Our opponent deploys an Ember Monk and we move in for the obvious attack. And unfortunately for our opponent, they block in a way that they still leave themselves at lethal. They have either missed the overwhelm damage or the impact damage. And that's just something that never is allowed to happen to you. There is the eye on the left side that you always have to use if you are blocking or attacking and just make sure you don't leave yourself just taking six damage and dying in a game where you still had a lot of chances and it was not over yet by any means. I myself didn't even notice it because I didn't use the eye in the moment. I went for the mini morph and then was surprised myself to see my opponent just dying to my attack. This moves us to game two. I of course had to bring my Misfortune deck, I didn't equip my skin yet, it will be equipped for the future rounds of the Gauntlet. My opponent decided to bring their Callista Viego deck here instead of the Banished B list. Let's see what that means for our Mulligan. So first of all we have to think about who is going to be the aggressor, who is going to win the long game and against, we play against the Viego deck, we don't have any hard removal in our deck. So we have to kill them before the Viego engine really comes online. So we have to take the aggressive role here as the scouts deck and can't like mulligan away our early game. We have to try to craft out to be really aggressive and to shoot our opponent down with our attacks and rallies before they establish their big board state. So I definitely wanted to keep my Flea Feather Tracker here. I was thinking about the Blinding Assault versus Marai Warden. I chose to go for the Marai Warden over Blinding Assault because the usual list runs a bunch of Wild Feasts. I didn't just want to have my 2-drop Wild Feasted. And Golden Aegis is just a little bit too early. Now you don't want to keep a Rally Effect if you don't have a full Curve or basically ever. A Rally Effect is like your late game, so you don't want to have it in your early game as the Scout deck. So this was my Mulligan and we were blessed by the gods to find our misfortune. On turn 1, my opponent played a go hard on my Fleet Feather Tracker and that immediately told me that they're not playing the standard version of Kindred Viego but more of a homebrew and go hard typically is played in a more controlish deck so I expected a more controlish list which once again meant for me that I had to be the aggressor, I had to go in 
be, take the initiative and try to rush my opponent down. This turn two is actually something you can look, take a look as well. We have the choice between the Veiler and the Narai Warden. And I'm actually not sure which one is the clear best option. Of course, the Veiler allows us to get challenged with the Misfortune. However, overall, the Narai Warden can output more damage if we have two attackers. Looking back, I might have heard playing the Dining Assault now, even waiting till my next turn and then play Dining Assault. So probably a little bit of a misplay here, mis missequencing but not game-changing by any means. Rai Warden had quite a low roll with a just vanilla 1-1 one, one Poro. And a very important decision here is to not block, of course, because our misfortune is very good at invalidating one health blockers. If you take this block, try to remove this unit from the board, then you remove your own unit from the board. And it's more important because their unit can't block unit prof units profitably with the misfortune on the board. However, then you can just lose out on damage. You really have to preserve your attackers as the scout stack and if you have the bolt in your hand. Turn four is probably the most impactful decision point in this game because they play out a Wardens of Prey. How would you plan out this turn. The first thing you should notice is that they have six mana and you have only four. I just played a one drop for now and we are not in a hurry to deploy anything. We want to keep up our sharp side, so just going for a rally for example would be kind of bad and it's fine for us if we lose our mana here. They have a second misfortune in hand, so if they have like a vengeance and kill our misfortune, then you can just play a second one and we don't just want to run out random units here. For example, if you play our Veiler, then they might go for a Withering Veil and take down all of our one health units. So they have to act first. They have six mana, we have four, and they will lose much more mana this turn if they do something. So I just went for a pass. And of course, passed again once they attacked me. No need to damage our own units here for these one ones that can't block us anyways. And then go for another pass, and opponent just passed back, losing three mana, whereas we only lost one. So we basically gained a lot of tempo just by passing here. For this turn, I of course wanted to get in my scout attack. And it's very important that you look at this sequencing here. Don't just run out your random stuff, just really plan out your turns. First thing we do is play our scout unit, because we can then transition to a scout attack. And if they now would go for a Withering Veil, I will only be left with three mana open and we could protect our Veiler with our sharp side and then still have another rally open, flip our misfortune and they would not be able to react to this with only three mana left over. They play a haunted relic out and it's getting clear that this is more of a custom deck than a very competitive deck but even these custom decks bring up interesting decision points and you can learn a lot from how this turn plays out. So here it's our tech token. And we technically have the chance to deploy our fortune broker. However, we have a scout unit on the board. So why would you play out a non-scout unit before doing the attack with our scout? Look at my challenge here. I purposefully challenge the Warden's Prey to give my opponent more options because I want them to go down under six mana. Because if they are under six mana, they can't stop my misfortune level up with a vengeance. So I purposefully draw in the Warden's Prey to give them a last breath unit in hand that they might play out instead of holding their spells. Indeed, they play it out and tap under 6 mana and now I know that I'm in the save for a Misfortune level up because they can't Vengeance her anymore. Because of that, I can also afford to run out my 2-2 two -two. and it's also, if you look at the opponent's deck and regions, they 2 health is the same as 3 health. They either have a Black Spare that just deals 4 damage immediately, or they have a Wild Feast that deals 1 damage. So it doesn't make no sense to kill off our 1 health units, for example. We can just hit our Misfortune and it doesn't change any kind of interaction they can have from Shadow Isles and Ionia. Our opponent then surprised me by playing out a Death Mark. Not a card I would have expected here for sure. 
but still you can sometimes be surprised and have to think about how to react from here. Many of you might have pulled the trigger on the misfortune make it rain and tried to snipe the 1-1 one -one on the A board. However, this make it rain is another copy of misfortune and if we deploy our two mana spell here, we can't play our golden aegis. So why try to save this misfortune, which is by far not true at all. It's like three out of six, so like a 50% chance approximately. And instead you could just go for the misfortune level up here and then play the other misfortune after the first one died. So playing the naked rain out here would be a very big mistake that should definitely not happen to any one of you. Even if it works out, it would be a mistake in the grand scheme of things. Instead, we let this happen. Level up our misfortune with our rally effect with the mana we banked up before. and proceed to easily win the game in the next turn. In the end, the opponent even showed us that they had the vengeance in hand as we were playing around the whole game. That thought, and that felt really rewarding. One last interesting trick here. If we wouldn't have won with our misfortune skill anyways, we could have played the barrier on our unit so that the lifesteal from Callista got prevented. Thank you so much for watching. These videos take a lot of effort to make, so I hope you like them, you learn something from them, and they are something different that nobody else has made before. See you tomorrow for the next Gauntlet match.